What's this now? Carson, he's finished. Gone. Let him go already. Let him take a walk. I'm sick of him with the quiet act, by the way. I know underneath it there's a lot of anger. He said so. He said he had rage issues. Ran after someone with a hatchet, didn't he? A knife, a hatchet. Watch out for the guys who talk that quietly. That's all I can tell you. That's why we love Trump. Bombastic, out there, says what he means. <clears throat> but with this one, no, no, I never, I like Carson because of the pediatric neurosurgeon and his politics were the opposite of Obama. I get it. But he's gone. His two top advisors flew the coop. So he's, he's done. He'll get a $4 million book advance to sell 12 copies. I don't understand that. I'm a writer. I've got to struggle for every dime I make as a, you know, as a writer. Well, they give these four, five, six million dollar advances. They earn back two hundred thousand dollars at most. I think Hillary sold twelve books. They gave her a nineteen million dollar advance. What do the publishers get out of that? Uh, figure it out. Figure it out. It's not a cocktail party. They're all holding companies anyway. Publisher. Who knows who the real holding company is? Okay, we got some good callers out there. Let's run through them. Let us go to WMAL. Adrian, you've been holding a long time. Make your point quickly. Fire away. The nuclear deal with Iran was the biggest, biggest, most terrible thing Obama has done. I mean, it's... Why, oh, just because Iran is threatening to, to wipe America off the planet? Isn't that what Obama wanted? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you say? It's a bad deal from the point of view of an American, but if you're Obama, it's a good deal. Oh, uh, they're, they're threatening us with weapons. They're threatening our warships now with rockets. This is good for Obama. This is what he wanted. He's working for the other side. He has to be. I wouldn't say that. I he, I don't know what side he's on. Do you? He, he's not on our side. That's for sure. Well, that's that's we know for sure. That that we can all agree upon. He's not on the side of America. That's pretty sure. That's why a guy like Seinfeld had him on his show. They're part of the same uh, ice cream cake. All right. Copy of zero goes out to you, staying alive. Julie, I don't know your station. I can't see it, but welcome to the program. Hi, Michael. I think that the best time that um, you are at your best on the radio is when you use your celebrity to make a difference like you did when you got Maddie back to the serviceman. I mean, within a day, generals were on that. And I don't know what the end of the story, I mean, is, updated story, but... That was well, there's a little bitterness in me. There's a little bitterness in me in that, I have to tell you. I gave that guy about $20,000 to buy a van. I never heard from him since. Not even a Christmas, nothing. Not even an email saying, thank you, Michael Savage, nothing. And this has happened to me before. It's happened with cops. It's happened with soldiers. It's happened with recipients of my scholarship fund. Not one of them sent a single email saying, thanks for the scholarship, Dr. Savage. It made a difference in my life. $20,000 to a kid? They think I owe it to them. They want me to do another scholarship fund. There, you have no idea the level. You have no idea the level of ungratefulness in the world. But we all know you made a difference. You made a difference there. I know. So I'm supposed to say, well, I made a difference, and the the happiness should be in me and knowing I made a difference. I'm not that kind of person. I kind of need thanks every once in a while from the guy I got the dog back, or the soldiers I got out of the out of the brig. Or the kids I gave scholarships to, not uh, not an email saying thank you, Dr. Savage, nothing. You know, it's enough to make you really more cynical than you are if you're a cynic. That was talking anyway, a copy of Government Zero goes out to me. Thanks for the comment. I like to help people. But I'm not like, uh, you know, the you know, the show The Millionaire where he gave the money out. Remember, he was anonymous when I was in the 50s. He didn't need anything for it. He was such a great man. Well, he was fictional. He was a fiction. <laughs> You know, if a human gives something, they usually want someone to say thank you. Don't think I'm going. It's in the human condition. Let's say you guess you want to help somebody. Yes. And it gives you pleasure. But don't you want them to be grateful? So what? You're supposed to be like, oh, well, I don't need thanks. I'm such a big man that let him have that van with the dog. Let him ride around as I know at night as I fall asleep that I made a difference in the world. And all of the children that I gave $20,000 uh, college, let them in enjoy it. I don't need their thanks. Well, I do need their thanks. So they're asking me, you want to do a scholarship fund again for the next year? I'm not so sure right now. Not with the level of ungratefulness out there. Maybe I'll do with the fund for something else, like for dogs or an elephant or saving elephants better than a kid. Let them go work at McDonald's with their pimply faces. 
Let him work till 2 in the morning and know what it's like. No one gave me a scholarship. I worked two jobs and took a bus in the slush. That's all. I'm not complaining. I'm saying that's what it was. I knew if I wanted to climb out of poverty, no one was going to help me out of poverty. I had to do it myself. Buses and subways. and You have no idea the road, how, what it is to succeed. You think it was given to me because I'm white? Are you kidding me? Think someone reached down, oh, hello, white boy. Here's a gift for you. No, there was no such thing. This is a nonsense about white privilege, that there's an inside track and a wing. Yeah, if you were rich, there was an inside track, that's for sure. Your father got you into colleges you were not I admitted to. They call it a legacy admission, right? You are a moron, but they let you in because your father gave money. Well, I didn't have a legacy admission. I had a slush admission. I was walking out of walk, a walking slush with rubber boots on to the bus. That was the admission I had. Then take a job after school. I'm not complaining. When you're young, you can do anything. You think you can conquer the world, and in a way you can. You can move mountains if you have faith in yourself. And you just keep going and going and going and going and going and going. Nothing stops you. Nothing. Not one. No matter what. And you're going to have a thousand impediments. But the day you think the impediments are put there because it's unfair, because life should be easier, you're finished. You're never going to make it. Nothing will help you. You'll have a resentment factor that will cripple you the rest of your life. You have to expect impediments in everything you you try to do. I'll never forget when I was 18 years old, I went to a sales seminar in Manhattan from a bunch of con men. I don't know what they were selling. Like a get-rich-quick scheme. You went to some number. You went to... I answered an ad. So I sat in the room, and some slick con men, old and young in a the room, they were really sharp. And they were like, they taught you how to sell. I don't know what they were selling, but they gave me a sales book. To this day, I remember what they told. In the sales book, there was a line I'll never forget. It said, remember, the sale begins when the customer says no. That has worked for me my entire life. That's 100% true. I was a, you know, a timid kid. I didn't know how to sell, but I, you know, if someone said no, I went away. Let's say I was even selling a newspaper route or a magazine. Hey, were you liking uh, a magazine? No, go away, kid. Oh, okay. Kids, kids are scared. They're, 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 they're insecure. That's what they call kids. You have to learn to put on a shell and make believe you're not scared. But I learned that from them, you know, remember the sale begins when the customer says no. I don't want to be a, you know, uh, that was true even with dating girls, i got to tell you the truth. Am I wrong? What do you think? Every girl, even if she likes you, is going to say no, isn't she? That's the nature of the boy and girl thing. You know, hey, Judy, would you like to go out Saturday night? Uh -huh. No, don't call me again. Oh, okay. The kid hangs up. He's insecure. Moves to San Francisco. That's the last you hear of him. Never again. He's shattered because she said no to him. But the, the sale begins when Judy says no. You got to call Judy ten times till Judy says yes. Just to get you off her back, she'll say yes. Let's say you're an ugly kid with pimples and she's the most beautiful cheerleader. If you keep calling her, just keep calling her. She'll say yes just to get rid of you. She figures she'll go out with you just to have you stop already. And then she may actually like you. She'll find out, you know, he's not so bad, even though he's ugly with pimples. And uh, he's a conservative. I might just, you never know. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Come on. I'm not kidding at all. Well, where are we already? I can't, you know, I'm trying to, like, drag this out because I don't want it to end. Do you realize that when this show ends in, like, 10 minutes, it's the end of 15 for me? Tomorrow's the best of. I'm not on because no one listens tomorrow. I don't know what they do. Rose Bowl, football. No one's. No one listens to radio tomorrow. It's a famous. The, the, so we got a great best of. But I'm not going to be here. I'll be some. I may be flying back to San Francisco tomorrow. I don't know what I'm doing. I could stay the weekend and be back in L.A. Stay the L.A. I'm kind of liking L.A. I like the scene. And um, tonight's party should be fun a little bit. Ten, an hour max. I how am I going to stay four hours? With, with Yorkshire pudding and roast beef. Yeah, I don't care if they were serving. I can't stay. How can you put in four hours with people? What a shift. That is longer than this show. If I get there at 8, he wants me to stay till 12.30. Four and a half hours, I can't do that. My show is three hours. How do you excuse yourself from a party? You shouldn't go. You say you have a migraine or something. I said to him, I said, look, I'll come at 8, but I'll probably leave at 10. No, 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 you have to stay to the end. Right away, I'm, I'm finished before I walk through the door. Robert, what's the way out of that one? Say my wife, something happened with her, that she got a migraine? She isn't going to let me get away with that. She's never used me as an excuse. I learned that years ago. I get my head cut off if I use her as an excuse. 
Are you joking? No, no, no. She don't want me to. She says, you know, be a man. You want to leave? Then tell him you're leaving. Don't use me. Even to this day, I mean, you got to come up with like, ple- how do you get out of a thing like that? I don't know. I'll have to figure it out. By Monday, I'll have an answer. Uh oh. That's it. The clock turned red. I'll be back in a minute. All right. Very, very sad to end the show on this note. Police in Munich, Germany, warn of imminent threat of terror attack. They closed down two train stations. Thank you, Angela Jerkel. Angela Jackal, who is flooding Germany with over a million Muslim refugees, primarily males of military age, should be arrested for what she's doing to that nation. And tonight we see police in Munich are asking people to stay away from the city's main train station and a second station in the city's passing, passing neighborhood because of, quote, serious imminent threat of a terror attack. Now, who do you suppose is the serious threatening element. Would it be Christians? No. Jews? No. Hindus? No. Buddhists? No. You know who, but you can't say it, can you? They know who it is. They know who they are. They know what districts they live in. And because of the insanity of the communists who are running their country, they cannot preemptively arrest them. They have to wait until their children are laying in a pool of blood. Gene, you're going to be the last caller of the year. Gene, fire away. What's your last comment, please? Okay, Mike, uh, I want to tell you that uh, my favorite show was when you interviewed Carlo Gambino's son because I'm 70 years old, and I shook hands with Carlo Gambino at my reception wedding in 1969. It was a couple of my father's. Mob friends, so I just... Unbelievable. So you're responsible for the tainted olive oil, huh? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> he was great. I loved him on the show. The thing is, though, I wish he could have stopped the San Bernardino. He didn't. No. <laughs> I mean, hey, Gene, Gene, man, I'm moving next week from BAP, you know, to KLIF, another station in town. Not against... I, I didn't ask for it. They're playing checkers with my show. Gene, I'm sending you a copy of Government Zero. Thanks for listening. God bless you. May you have a great 2016. Good night, everybody. Best of tomorrow. Back with God's will on Monday. Savage.